Welcome to Keys to Developing a Hybrid Cloud Strategy, a health system CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Sidious Tech. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send in your questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll take them later in the program. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time, first we're going to go about 35, 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Tony Ambrosi, Chief Digital and Information Officer with Baptist Health South Florida, John Kravitz, CIO with Geisinger Health System, and John Squayo, SVP Provider and Healthcare Services with Sidious Tech. And then we will do our Q&A. So let's jump right in. Lots of good stuff to talk about. Tony, we're going to start with you. Can you give me an overview of your organization and role? Absolutely. So um, I am the Chief Digital and Information Officer for Baptist Health of South Florida. This is a, the, one of the largest uh, uh, healthcare provider organizations uh, in, in South Florida. Um, about 12 hospitals, 25,000 employees. And I started here in this role about two years ago, I mean, quite shortly two years ago, um, focused on a transformation, digital transformation, um, data, um, and among other things, of course, as a, as a way to get to those places, uh, cloud and cloud migration. Very good, Tony. Thank you. John Kravitz. Yes, thank you, uh, Anthony. So yeah, Geisinger is an academic integrated delivery network, meaning we have medical school, um, graduate education, biomedical engineering, uh, as well as nursing, um, a health plan with about 600,000 members, as well as in a clinical enterprise. Uh, I am the corporate CIO, so I'm responsible for all areas of the organization. Um, we have uh, approximately 10 hospitals with about 24,000 employees across the organization. Uh, my, my job and responsibility, as I stated, is corporate, so set all the strategy for the organization uh, and lead the operational teams, which will, um, in effect, similar to Tony, uh, deploying a lot of new digital strategies, a lot of new digital technology to support the operations and automating a lot of processes. So uh, very excited about that, and uh, it's a great opportunity to participate in this in this uh, lecture series. Thank you, John. Uh, John Squayo. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, John Squayo, uh, based out of Chicago. I lead the provider market for Sidious Tech. And um, Sidious Tech, uh, we are a digital solutions uh, organization bringing um, systems integration and product to uh, only healthcare clients. So we only work in the healthcare ecosystem and life sciences, 7,500 engineers and also functional consultants um, with global delivery centers in a number of countries. And we've been in business for 15 years and super excited to have this panel today. Very good. Thank you, John. All right, uh, Tony, we're going to start with you. Uh, talk about the, some of the cloud arrangements you've entered into. When did the journey begin and what were some of the initial reasons a change from on-premise was pursued? What were the benefits sought? Uh, these are not minor, minor deals. How long did it take to make a final decision, to get the organization on board with a final decision? What do you think are some of the best practices around governance to ensure the decision is properly vetted by all relevant parties? And for those who had reservations, what were they and how were those concerns addressed? So anywhere you want to jump in there, Tony. Um, sure. Um, a little bit of a... Uh, uh, Open secret uh, for me, um, this the migration at the cloud migration at uh, Baptist if is the second, if not the third um, iteration after a uh, data center migration at Amex about 10 years ago and the cloud migration at Disney Parks about five years ago. So um, from each, I had my our, our learnings, if you want, and that they, they tuned the uh, all the subsequent uh, efforts, including including Baptist, um, uh, and the uh, migration of Baptist started a few months after I joined. Uh, Baptist had no cloud deployment at that time, uh, therefore uh, no plan or readiness or team. So all that had to be uh, built from from scratch. 
Uh, in truth, uh, when I came in, uh, people said, no, uh, cloud is not going to work for baptism. And I've said, why would that be? Um, and, um, but the, the two, there were two main drivers. And I, I start with the one that uh, is the immediate one, and it's, it talks about money. Uh, although, because that's really, that's how the migration is funded. And that is, um, you know, um, looking for cost efficiencies, cost reductions. Um, we had a challenge with a oversized and very expensive uh, and owned data center. And therefore, it was relatively uh, easy to make the case for a migration on those grounds alone. And that's easy to explain to the board and the you know, finance committee of the board and to the CFO. Uh, but, but in long term, um, especially with my focus on, on digital and data and, and the transformation of the organization, long term, uh, the, the driver for the migration um, was really to obtain uh, the capabilities that only uh, the cloud provides in all the cloud, major proud cloud um, uh, providers. Uh, both in terms of in technology terms and things like app management and flexibility and speed and, and, and advanced automation, um, but also intrinsic capabilities um, uh, and richness of, of those capabilities that would support um, things like digital and data. Uh, I don't think you can realistically do digital and data uh, other than in the cloud. Um, so I think the, the decision was not very hard to make once we established the, the business case. Um, I think it took a little bit longer to put that, that, that together um, and, and have everybody explain to, to everybody how this would work. And that's where the, the, my previous um, experience helped because, as I said, it wasn't the first time I, I, uh, I went through that exercise and um, making sure that everybody understands how it will work and what will happen and um, uh, what would be the outcomes. Um, I think the contract negotiations took a long time, uh, longer than I expected, um, but simply because this was something new um, for partners in finance and procurement, contracting, legal, so on and so forth. And so there was a somewhat of an educational uh, a process uh, going through for that contract. Um, so I think you mean I'm sorry. The contract negotiations you're talking about internally getting things organized, not even with the vendor. No, with the vendor. So oh, with the vendor. With the vendor. Once we established that that case and we put together that that case, the the um, uh, I think that that was that was straightforward. But uh, contract negotiations with the vendor. Um, although the contract was a standard contract that I remember uh, seeing before, it was a little bit of a uh, education uh, and journey together to understand for everybody to understand how how cloud really works and how you manage it and how you control costs and so on and so forth. Uh, very good. So Tony, just um, another follow up. If if for a CIO who's uh, sort of very pro wants to move in this direction, um, can you think of any typical objections? Uh, who the constituencies might be making those objections and how they could be overcome? Anything come to mind with, oh, you're going to hear this. This group is going to say you can't do it because of this. Uh, yes, and there are, and and uh, uh, you know, a couple are. Uh, one is about costs. Uh, in, 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 in interesting enough, um, because some folks hear, oh, cost, uh, the cl cloud will cost you more, which is true if it's not managed properly. If every developer and every system manager in the organization can create um, instances and uh, allocate storage and there is no control and there is no, um, uh, no, no uh, governance, yeah, you, you, that can get out of hand. So that's where we put together that a, a governance and, and controls and, um, um, and on the monitoring side, if you want, uh, in terms of usage, uh, capacity allocation, um, and so on and so forth. The second one is, incidentally, for especially for um, healthcare, is one related to security. There are folks and there are systems who are resolute against cloud because they perceive it as less secure than their internal data data center. 
um, which is somewhat interesting because um, I think if folks think that they're 20, 30 year old data center that's full of Windows uh, not in, you know, um, XP and Windows uh, 7 um, is secure, I think that's, that's a misnomer. But there's an ex exercise there in articulating that yes, things could get a lot more dangerous in the cloud, but at the same time, there are a lot more uh, structures, there are a lot more tools, there are a lot more uh, vendors you can pull from marketplace to enhance that, that security. It's still a hard job, by the way, but um, that's, those are the two, some of the, the, the two um, um, uh, things that I, I, I hear, I heard uh, in the past, but they can be um, uh, mitigated through the articulation of how we're doing and as everything else is you start small and you prove it um, and um, you know do it on a small scale and prove that it works uh, for us and for for me that doing it on a small scale was simply because we were starting the digital journey and therefore everything digital went straight in the cloud and we said see here is how it works very good very good john kravitz wherever you want to jump in there lots uh, lots of uh, opportunities to lots of topics you can jump on yeah, and actually, I think Tony did a fabulous job in explaining that because, you know, having had done this twice prior to coming to Baptist is really valuable. Um, for myself, this is my first foray into the cloud. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of apprehension, just like there is with a lot of other CIOs that I talked to at Chime and other organizations that I belong to. Um, there's there's a lot of apprehension. and. It's primarily focused around cost, as Tony had talked about, and I do completely agree with his comments in that you need to govern it properly and manage it properly uh, to be able to control those costs and to control the use of that data or the or the resources in the cloud because it can get out of hand if you don't manage it properly. Um, for us, the journey began about a year ago, um, and I was very apprehensive in the beginning, not having done this prior. Um, researched, read a lot of articles, talked to a lot of people, and still had questions about the cost. I knew there were values that we wanted to take advantage of. We wanted the agility of being in the cloud as, as uh, Tony spoke about, you know, digital. We want to do a lot of new digital things, and digital is in the cloud, right? So to enable things like patient identification with facial recognition, we do that, uh, especially at the reg and admission areas, and we want to do that throughout the organization. Uh, and the best way to be able to do that is in the cloud, cloud to cloud through hybrid cloud connectivity. So those are some examples, but we do a lot with bots and other things. Um, our intent though, was to really go through this journey, look at it for digital, but even more importantly, look at it for business continuity services, disaster recovery and business continuity, the ability for us to have our electronic health record available, five nines available, <coughs> if not higher. So to us, that's a concern. Um, we're coming from three data centers and, um, and they've been around a long time. Some have robotics, you know, and, and some have people on them, but really don't wanna be in the data center business. I wanna be in the business of helping move the organization forward or driving the business. And we shouldn't be worried about being technology people with management of servers and storage and other things. Yeah, that's important, but it's really not what we're here for. Uh, we're here to leverage the business to move it forward. So, you know, we engaged um, another outside organization to assist through this process who has done this with cloud migrations uh, in other industries. And so that was helpful for me to be able to get on board and to have some credibility when I, I approached our leadership team and the board of directors for, you know, the opportunity to move this forward. Did get overwhelming support to do so. And, uh, and for us, we are on the journey. We've already started migrating, probably about 50 different apps have migrated and we're moving forward. Um, we will be the largest Epic uh, installation in the cloud when we're done uh, for production, DR first, but then production afterward. So we're excited about this. Um, really the ability for us to be able to to get applications up quickly when it has a definitive business need and it goes through our governance process. Uh, because usually, or in the past, most everyone wants a new application in our organization. And, uh, and so we try to manage that effectively so we can keep our costs manageable and then keep our costs in the cloud manageable as well. 
So governance is extremely important um, in our organization. I think in most organizations that are going to be considering the cloud migration, uh, governance in reducing your application portfolio before you migrate to the cloud, um, not looking to do a lift and shift, but actually, you know, appropriate cloud-based applications that will run effectively, efficiently, not over allocate resources for storage or compute, uh, because we all know vendors get a little sloppy in those areas and, uh, and over allocate and underutilize. <laughs> so, you know, from that perspective, I think it's important to get SaaS-based or platform as a service uh, applications in the cloud. So we're being driven effectively and efficiently. Um, were there reservations in our organization? I think once it was all explained um, and some real examples and, and also having the vendor partner to give some historical uh, perspective to it where they've done this before, I think that added credibility to the equation. And I think it supported me very well. And uh, we overwhelmingly have support to do it. Will we save money in the long run? Yes, we will. Um, it'll take time for the old depreciable assets to wash out, you know, number of years. They're typically on a five-year depreciation cycle. But uh, but we expect to save millions uh, when we're done. And then we will manage it carefully. When we retire applications, all the cost of the application goes away. The license, the hosting, personnel will support those apps in the cloud, as well as the uh, the cost for support, maintenance and support. So it really is to our advantage to be able to migrate our applications to the cloud because it's much more efficient and timely to be able to get those to operational point. <clears throat> Quick follow-up, John. Uh, tell me more about this outside group you brought in, um, what you were leveraging them for. Was it uh, just to build a business case that would support what you wanted to do, sort of an outside endorsement that this was the right strategy or are they more than that in terms of they're going to actually help accomplish? Um, so in terms of what you use them for, and then your recommendation for your CIO colleagues of, yeah, you really want to get someone in for this type of help. Yeah, so we, you know, it's it's not a secret. We use Deloitte Consulting to assist us through this process. Um, it was more of an affirmation of, you know, the migration to the cloud. Uh, however, we didn't have the experience within our team and with you know remote workers and losing people um, during the great you know resignation period, if you will, my intent was to be able to retool our people that are in our infrastructure area to be able to support applications in the cloud, manage them, load them, do all the things we need to do to migrate them, and support them long term. So you know we worked with Deloitte for a, a period of contract period of term to assist and do knowledge transfer for our people. And, uh, and that's been very successful for us to date. Uh, it's not a long-term engagement. It will end and our people will pick up and continue on with that work going forward. So again, having been new to this area, wanted to have some guardrails around the process to make sure we were successful. And, uh, and that's why I engaged them from the outside to do that work. Very good. John Squayo, anywhere you want to jump in there? Lots of stuff has been covered, but uh, where do you want to jump in? Yeah, you know, I I, I think that uh, Tony and John covered a lot of, of the key points. Um, I, I like the, you know, um, one of the points made about really utilizing organizations that have done it before and, and the industries that, that we've seen really start in healthcare primarily have been in pharmaceutical kind of first movers, payers or uh, ahead of providers on their journey to cloud, um, not necessarily of their core systems, but definitely of their data, uh, um, you know, uh, estate. Um, and then, you know, a lot of experience gained there can then, you know, really inform and de-risk uh, these migrations that happen in, in, the, um, in the provider realm. I would say that just taking a step further, you know, I think it was alluded to the idea of really, this gives you an opportunity to optimize your, your financial ops and really get granular on on where the utilization is coming from and and you know when if you if you take this inflection point when you're going to cloud and truly tag all of those workloads effectively um, back to who to li who is really utilizing them then you can eventually get into you know showing back who's utilizing it and eventually potentially go to a, a actual you know use as you go type of charge back or pay as you go to the departments and that gets everyone more disciplined and when you think about it that's really not only 
driving your, your financial goals, but your sustainability goals, because the less compute and the less storage we use just to meet our business needs is better for, for everybody. It's better for patients and it's better for the environment, um, et cetera. So I, I think that that's getting you know, really smart and uh, you know, um, uh, deliberate about that is key. And then of course, it, it really does test our traditional operating models and our traditional org charts on, on where people can evolve and reskill to, to really optimize the cloud. All right, very good. Uh, John Sway, we're gonna stick with you. What are you seeing as trends around health systems migrating to the public cloud? Is it mostly lift and shift or are we seeing widespread adoption of native cloud services? And what categories of health systems are taking a wait and see approach? Yeah, okay, so just to take that in pieces here, the, the, the primary trends that we're seeing, right, is that I think much to what uh, Tony had alluded to about the concern about risk of putting your uh, data state in the cloud is, is somewhat um, you know, uh, uh, mitigated. Uh, I think a lot of CISOs and uh, CIOs and other um, business leaders have realized uh, even in compliance that a lot of our most um, critical correspondences are already in cloud if we're using Teams. And a lot of our key information about our employees is, uh, and their families is already there if we're using a, you know, a SaaS product Workday or, or others. Um, or, you know, any other collaboration communications that, that are similar to teams. So, you know, it's there and we're at risk, but in fact, as we've also simultaneously seen ransomware grow in its instances and, and holding, um, you know, certain, uh, health systems, um, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, to basically to their knees with their operations, I, I think that there's this opportunity to move to cloud and, and recognize that the big public cloud are investing extremely heavily in, in their, their security. Um, and their ability to mitigate those types of risks. So I think security is less of an issue. I think that um, you know uh, the the interesting and most uh, exciting conversation now that we're seeing is EMR and cloud. Um, I know the John, perfect example. You guys bringing up another of another other health systems, or you know some are bringing Meditech into GCP. We see saw others bringing Epic and Cerner into AWS or OCI, and then others bringing Epic, et cetera, into uh, Azure. So quite a bit of acceleration there as those EMRs start to support the performance levels that the clouds can provide. Um, but at the end of the day, you know I, I do see a crawl walk run strategy primarily across the swath of health systems where if they're developing new data capabilities ones that are going to be over their systems of record that require data from the emr from claim systems social determinants of health multiple different types of varying data um, oftentimes they're starting with that in the cloud um, versus building it on-prem and one of the reasons is is they have access to new and advanced uh, types of capabilities they have you know, Google or Azure or AWS are building incredibly advanced AI um, capabilities uh, or, you know, I mean, we've seen the acquisition um, with Azure, uh, just nuance, you know, so you have, you know, keyboardless types of experiences. And if you want to access that kind of as a pay, you go, pay as you go um, basis to try to test that out, it's a great opportunity to start there. Then we see them from a risk paradigm kind of going to the ancillary applications. Those are uh, mostly, you um, you know, uh, commercial off the shelf products and and quite typically you're, you can't really do a lot of reimagining on those applications. So very often that is a lift and shift or rehost when they do that. Um, obviously, not, obviously, a lot of those are highly dependent on communications with the EMR and therefore you have to do kind of groupings so that you don't have a performance hit. If you bifurcate some of your applications in the cloud and some still on prem, you don't want the WAN to, impl to uh, you know, uh, impede your performance. Um, but some of them are going up the ladder of the so-called seven R's, which is, you know, rehost it, refactor it, um, and then re-architect and, re and re-platform, where you might actually take a, 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 you know, consolidated database and have multiple systems hitting that one database and really getting efficiency. Some are replacing and retiring either before or after. It's always preferred before. And some are completely reimagining. We're seeing that less in provider. We're seeing that more in payer where they have a little bit more um, autonomy uh, about their core systems, right? Whereas in provider, we've always been, you know, um, focused on our EMRs uh, to a large extent, and then have a lot of autonomy outside of the the different domains that that may touch. So, um, but nevertheless, in we're seeing in consumer uh, types of um, uh, digital front door, in in consumer types of uh, of UI and UX, in contact center, just tons of innovation happening there 
that um, on the reimagined front where people are completely starting to uh, to address those um, and uh, and then that's not really on their EMR roadmap. So those are the areas that we're primarily seeing. Obviously, that takes a lot of resources, right, to do. And um, while the cost and the economics are coming down, we're seeing the first movers in that, primarily being academic medical centers, large uh, community health centers. Um, you know, these are integrated delivery networks that are well that are well funded. But in fact, we're also seeing a, a number of of say uh, four to five hospital systems in a market um, that may not be you know extremely um, well well financed or well funded, taking just their EMR in the cloud. And those are uh, many tech shops. Some of them, some of them are Cerner, some of them are uh, Epic. But uh, we're seeing it's almost like uh, there's different reasons. The the big ones are kind of leading with other types of applications or data estates first. And then some of the small ones are just taking their EMR and going, um, which is really interesting too. Very good, John, thank you. <clears throat> All right, next question, John Kravitz, we're gonna start with you. How are health systems thinking about which apps to move to the cloud first? And where does the EMR fit into cloud migration roadmaps? Yeah, I think uh, so. So the EMR absolutely fits into it, and it's probably our most precious resource when it comes to applications, specifically when we're talking about the patients and the lives for those patients. Um, I wouldn't say it's the first move. Uh, there will be a number of different applications, especially in our environment, that don't uh, necessarily go to the cloud right now. Um, things like, you know, the PAX imaging systems. Uh, we'll eventually be able to get there, but I, I don't think we're ready for prime time to make that transition, at least in our experience. Um, you know, analyzers that connect, um, you know, middleware that connects to analyzers for laboratory and other things really need to be on-prem to be able to support that, but connecting and, and feeding back to the electronic health record systems. Um, we've looked at, at some of our areas so that we can prove when we're doing the migration that it's working effectively. Uh, we started with you know, training systems or test systems before we migrated production systems. We've looked at different parts of the organization that aren't necessarily as connected into the electronic health record before we started our migration. And I've mentioned we have about 50 systems in the cloud right now. We started looking at our big uh, uh, claims processing engine and things like that from the health plan. So that's all windows, that's, that's fine, that can move. And, uh, and we're starting to move that process as well. Planning for the EMR is huge. And so that is a big component of this. And it will take us another 12 months, uh, at least as, as we're anticipating in our, our project timelines, before we can go to get production into the, into the uh, cloud, production EMR. We'll work first on the DR. Uh, so we've been mapping all of our work out uh, for systems like I mentioned, the PAC systems, imaging systems, things like that, that won't be in the cloud uh, in the near term. And, uh, and how we're going to integrate those effectively. So for DR purposes, that's our first uh, major uh, hurdle, if you will, that we're, we're working through on architecture right now. Um, and then we'll continue to move forward with migration and we hope within 12 to 18 months, we'll have all of our Epic environment in the cloud fully functioning. Um, what we expect to see is, is higher performance uh, than we're seeing now. Um, and Epic, by the way, is, is migrating over to their HTML version of their software. So that's happening in stages. Uh, and our first stages will be happening in the November, December timeframe. We do upgrades to be able to get there uh, moving forward. It's called Hyperdrive with Epic. Um, so that's going to be part of the process. We also, you know, because of, of the, the size of, you know, the database and everything else that we've had, we've been on Epic for 25 plus years as an organization, third third deployment of it throughout the uh, throughout the country, and so you know the size of our database is quite large, um, and we were concerned about you know having enough processing power and not hitting the ceiling if we had another major acquisition or a merger that we were going to, to undertake, um, and so we we're working with AWS. They've been staying ahead on the processing and compute side. Uh, we don't have that concern anymore. Um, and we see year over year, they'll continue to stay ahead of us with providing more elasticity and, com and capacity uh, for us to continue moving forward without any apprehension or concerns. So, you know, it's all important. It, it fits well into our plan and uh, we're excited to execute upon that plan. 
Very good. Tony, your thoughts? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, uh, our EMR is already SAS. It's at Cerner. Um, so uh, fortunately, I don't have to move an EMR. Uh, EMR is unique as a system in an organization, in a provider organization, compared to everything that I've known. No other industry, I think, uh, has one system so absolutely dominant uh, in their uh, technology ecosystem. Um, in terms of uh, which apps to move uh, to the cloud first, I would say first try and, and with uh, simpler and less impactful uh, apps, um, just so you can try and tune the technology and the <coughs> processes and the team. Um, so that will definitely not be uh, the EMR or imaging system first. Um, um, uh, the, speak, the, the two Johns here mentioned, uh, starting with DRs, yes, DRs, backups first to get, uh, uh, to get the experience. Um, I think, you know, then the next conversation would be, um, uh, as John said, it's about lift and shift um, versus re-engineering. Now, in a lot of cases, more so than other places in, uh, in the provider space, a lot of the applications are vendor applications, so um, re-engineering is very hard to, to, to do. Not impossible, but very hard. Uh, and that's where maybe um, um, some apps can be moved to a vendor SaaS model, uh, which is beneficial. Um, so you, you get out of the hosting servers for someone else's application. Um, and um, uh, in terms of re-engineering, because I think that's, that's a big question, um, I get is um, even even among those that can be re-engineered, let's say um, internal app developed applications, um, the focus even among those there, the focus should be on those apps that would benefit most out of that re-engineering. Um, you know whether it's for new capabilities offered by the cloud, or for availability and resilience, um, focus there first. Um, or um, re-engineer those that change more often because then um, you can bait and take advantage of um, the management uh, capabilities in the cloud, therefore easier to deploy, uh, things like that, Use easier to manage so you get more human benefit. Um, now, I've, I've encountered situations where um, sometimes it's just easier to do a lift and shift and then to re-engineer once in the cloud, sometimes in, in pieces, uh, depending on what the application is. Um, or in the example I was offered uh, in terms of grouping, things that kind of work together, you move them first, uh, all of them uh, with minimal changes as lift and shift, and then get, they get uh, re-engineered. Um, now, one thing, uh, it's, it's important uh, some apps, especially the older ones, can be very chatty in their interfaces, um, you know, interfaces between, between systems. Um, and so deploying uh, them in a more distant cloud region uh, could introduce problematic uh, latencies, and that, that could be a big problem. Um, there, um, either re-engineering may be required or uh, other solutions such as um, local cloud uh, regions. This is something that I think uh, all three major providers now offer, which is smaller data centers, but they're closer to, uh, or, but they're more, uh, more dispersed, therefore probably uh, closer to um, uh, the provider's locations, therefore low, lower uh, latency. Or if not a true cloud, true hybrid, I would say, which is some local uh, deployment of a cloud um, uh, appliance of sorts. Uh, then it is, it may be still on, on prem physically, but it's really a, a cloud appliance. Um, now, as, as someone else said, is while all this effort is on the way, uh, new things should go in the cloud. Okay, well, John Squayo, there's <clears throat> a lot of stuff Tony threw out there and John, a lot of sort of the way they're looking at things and approaching things in order and and uh, that, that they would do things and things like that. Um, what are you thinking about what you've heard? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that uh, that I would agree with all of that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, one thing that I've always got on my mind and, you know, did when I was a 
CIO and, and certainly have five years as a consultant, I've seen, you know, life sciences do this and, and, and now it's been uh, eight years since they kind of started that journey is we have to constantly think about how we're going to retool our workforce because um, it is a big change as we, as we go through this. And it's, it's, I think it's a bigger change on the people than it is on the systems um, that we have managing this because um, they're learning entirely new um, uh, types of skills. And that is particularly poignant, poignant when we talk about our EMR uh, 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 teams, um, uh, particularly if we're moving from an on-prem into a, into a, a cloud environment. Um, you know, we, we, you know, you, it might be, you used to necessarily change, you know, add an interface uh, um, in, in, in one you know, type of uh, process. And now we're going to add interfaces in a different type of process. We might, you know, attach vendors in. Um, the entire change enablement is just a huge portion of this, and it's not talked about as extensively as the actual, uh, you know, pre-planning migration or the app disposition or, or any of those components. So I think it's equally important. We got to stay cognizant of it, um, and we got to keep it completely, you know, transparent from a performance perspective to our end users. And I think if we do that, then that's successful. That's a, another very interesting point. I want to jump to our Ask Your Co-Panelist segment. John Squay, I want to give you an opportunity to ask one or both of your co-panelists a question. Sure. I, I, I think that I'm most curious to both of you about how do we communicate um, how we're going to de-risk uh, these types of activities um, to our leadership and how we do that effectively and what have been some of their biggest concerns as you've talked about these ma major initiatives. John Kravis, why don't you jump in first? Yeah, I think uh, so. So de-risking as far as, you know, the availability of systems and, uh, and you know, the ability for us to utilize tools that are going to uh, support the enterprise are extremely important. Uh, we all know we're in, in a state of malware attack daily. I mean, it hits us, every one of us daily, continuously. And so, you know, the ability for us to be able to be resilient and dynamic and be able to recover quickly is important to our organizations. So from my perspective, cloud provides a lot of that capability. Yes, you still need to make sure your environment is clean and safe and protected on your local area network and, and connectivity into the cloud. But you know the ability to utilize cloud security tools in addition to the security tools that we have in place and create a single, um, single frame that you could review and be alerted to things um, utilizing you know services for managed security services platforms things like that are also important um, we'd like to take as much of a proactive approach as we can um, not saying that we've got this thing licked i don't think anybody has it licked when it comes to cyber but um, just protecting the organization to the best of our ability and mitigating risk as much as possible so that's really the reason why we've looked at doing that tony Uh, Tony, you take yourself off mute, bud. There we go. I, th I, th I think John articulated greatly. Um, uh, I think the, the the approach with this and other things in terms of change, a big change, a big transformation, um, is really what I call tell first and then show, uh, which is articulating for all those dimensions, whether it's, it's cost, whether it's uh, the security, um, articulate the benefits and how would you do it and how would it work and and to a point where people say yeah um, it makes sense uh, but can it be done can you do it and that's where the <clears throat> show part comes in which is you know as I said that there's more scale uh, prove whether it's even with their security and then you can you can articulate and show that the environment that has been built there is is more secure and more controlled and, and on-prem or Whatever, whatever dimensions need to, need to, to be um, to be articulated. I think that that would be that would be a, the the approach. Very good, Tony. Do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? Well, I think you know, turning back to John S. Um, I quite clearly, I think in in you know, for me coming from the outside of healthcare, uh, quite clearly uh, there is a a. Um, um, a reticence among provider system uh, provider systems to go to the cloud still even to this this day um, I've seen this maybe I don't know maybe seven eight nine years ago um, uh, but 
it's it's you know that kind of dissipated elsewhere and everybody kind of uh, uh, moved. Um, how would we together, you know, CIOs here or, or folks involved in this, to uh, help each other um, with you know other than this great uh, uh, webinar, help each other <laughs> articulate uh, and and make it clear and maybe for our our uh, use cases. I spoke at an uh, Amazon. Um, uh, that reinvent last year, and I said, "This is how we did it." And this is, but uh, helping each other more on on these journeys. Um, and maybe some of us are more advanced with certain things in, in uh, and others in other things, and maybe um, help each other more um, with our constituencies and ourselves. Yeah. So, um, if I understand the questions, like what what. Uh, what groups do we have or what best practices can we share, et cetera, and what forums, if that's where you're going with this, Tony? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, you know, um, gosh, you know, it, it, I know uh, Chime has done a great job at, at having uh, um, different types of forums and Hims does a great job. At the end of the day, I, what is interesting is I don't think we have one a, a single body uh, kind of even separated or bifurcated to talk about this huge inflection point with cloud and and how um, now I think the four big public clouds, if we include obviously Oracle in that that list, um, are going to change change things. So it's 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 always like a, a separate subject on our big panel of discussions. But I don't know if we have a place a forum to ch exchange best practices specific to this that also gets beyond you know executive level and gets someone some of the people that are in the trenches doing this doing control plane you know participating in that i think that would be a very exciting forum um at the end of the day though there is such a great body of knowledge um that you know could be injected into provider systems from the people who have who, who look at this as now old school that are in pharma you know that have had their estate well, you know, entrenched in AWS or Azure GCP now for, for you know, six, seven years, and they've seen it now, and they're looking at phase two or phase three, same with payer. It's a very interesting thing. I don't think a forum exists, but it's something that's exciting and I would like to be a part of and possibly facilitate. So um, I don't know. Uh, uh, John, um, do you do you know of one that exists really that fully focused on this? Yeah, I, well, I don't, there, no, I am not aware of any that exist right now, although, um, I do serve on the Chime board, so this might be a little bit of a politicking, and I'm the chair of the board for the foundation this year. But you know, that is our intent is education, right? Education and participation. And really, this is an area I think we can focus to assist CIOs in healthcare and, and really crowdsource it more, if you would, uh, to be able to ally some of those fears and concerns because, you know. The cost is the biggest factor that I've always heard from my my colleagues. And as I learn more about this, and Tony, I'm sure you could speak to this very, very concisely, but there are ways to manage that cost very effectively. You know, you could turn down, um, you know, big Citrix farms at night when they aren't used very much and not use all that compute power and running the meter, if you will. Same thing with training environments. You turn those things down if you're not using them on the weekend, shut them off. Like, don't run the meter. And, and then get the ability to see what your usage is on a daily basis. I think that is so important uh, to be able to manage your cost effectively. When I talk to my colleagues about this, they're like, really, you can do that? And it's like, well, when I first found out about it, I was pretty excited about it because then I felt like I was more in control, not being controlled by the, by the public cloud vendor, if you will. And, uh, and, and to me, that's where we can save some money. That's where we can get these benefits of the cloud, you know, putting an API platform in place, that should be table stakes, right? That you can do that integration. And so, you know, we've done that years ago before we even got to this decision point. And actually I'm excited about it, but I think, you know, that's that's an area I'm gonna recommend to Chime that, that they start doing some really strong education forums that people can learn from each other and, and get over that fear and consternation about migrating to the cloud. And, it, and, you know, we're not in one, we're in a hybrid, we, we're in all three, actually. So my API engine's in Google, my, you know, Microsoft is running uh, our whole platform stack for O365, and then I'm I'm in AWS too, and everything's connected together, so. Yeah, so I, I, just one last piece of that, just to, you know, I don't want to pile on it endlessly, I'm sure that Anthony wouldn't appreciate that, but <laughs> with ahead. our time budget. Go one ahead. thing that's super exciting that I had the opportunity to do with a payer is in addition to doing the chargeback or the showback and the chargeback to the departments, 
We also in, integrated in how much consumable energy they were using, mm. a, a legacy from their, from their, their uh, consumption when it was on-prem, and when it went to a renewable energy uh, data center in the cloud, and it was an absolute sense of pride and really drove a great discipline of how much they were asking, each department and service line was asking for when they realized how much they could contribute to sustainability goals. And they said, oh my gosh, yeah, if we, we don't need that much. Actually, we're going to, we were going to participate with you. We'll ramp up over this cycle. Don't give us too much at first. And they, they started actually participating with the, the IT when before it was just like, that was not really a priority for them. And it, it really just drove in a sense of excitement. And it wasn't that much more work once we tagged the workloads to figure that out and present that in the dashboard. So yeah, it was a, it's, it's, it's a total inflection, I think, in the way we do business. So we're gonna ask Anthony maybe to uh, start a forum uh, with where people can ask questions and people can answer, you know, like the ISACs for, uh, for security. All right, we'll take it under advisement, Tony. Thanks for the idea. Um, John Kravitz, your chance to ask a question from one or both of your co-panelists. I guess, uh, yeah, my, my, probably the biggest question I would have would be, you know, how did you guys ally the fares in your organizations? You know, I, and, and I've used Sidious Tech a lot for development and other things in the past, not for migration services or anything else. But, you know, Tony, you've been on, this is your third go around with the cloud, which I really respect because having been in other industries and having done it there, I think that's the biggest concern that I think a lot of the particip participants that are on this webinar today would be trying to understand how they can you know, really sell the idea of the cloud. It's not something that you just wanna flash and do, it's something that really is a game changer and it's the way business can improve. So how would you approach that? Uh, Tony, why don't you start? Sure. So, uh, as I said, and obviously I had the benefit, as you said, of uh, doing a data center migration and, and a cloud migration before. So I had um, some um, um, privileged entry into that conversation, so to speak. But then, you know, as I said, is articulating the benefits and articulating what it what it means and taking everybody through through those conversations and then uh, and then showing it, proving it and measuring it. Um, I see a, a a question here somewhere in the in the chat about uh, how do you measure, uh, how do you compare? Well, you actually measure, um, and 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 you show it, and people see it, and users see it, and and, um, and then that helps. And then you start with, as I said, you start small, and you start a little bit, then it works, and people get some level of confidence, and you get bigger and bigger. That way, until a point uh, you get the point uh, to a point where um, there is no uh, there is no uh, debate anymore. John Squire. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think that it's you know it, it, it's it's just a journey, and it's our next phase journey of, of of where we're going with our infrastructure and data. I mean, I really can't say any more about it than than probably what's been said here. But um, uh, it's um, it's in, inevitable, I think. Frankly, as uh, it's it's not new, right? We've done uh, cloud infrastructure before, just didn't call it cloud uh, when we had uh, you know a, a lot of our infrastructure out, uh, off prem. And so I, I would say that um, really, I mean, it's a total transformation. It takes the entire organization behind it to to actually uh, do these types of major transfer transformations, and um, uh, but the best place to start is with the lowest risk types of applications. So leave it there. All right, we're gonna take <clears throat> take a look at uh, audience questions uh, for a minute here before we go to final comments. Couple of questions around PAX, cloud and you know VNA type thing. Um, John Squayo, let me just get your thoughts on um, how you see that evolving? Do you see PACs eventually going into the cloud? Obviously, it doesn't sound like something people want to do first. Uh, your thoughts? You know, so anybody who's completely uh, forklifting their old PAC system out, I'm sure should really think about this, right? Uh, if, if they have a major refresh to do and they're completely reimagining how they're going to do their, their vendor neutral archive. But uh, what's interesting, um, as I talk to my colleagues that are doing, you know, very... Uh, really interesting thing in advanced imaging is I had an epiphany when they said it's not about necessarily just PACs and VNA. 
what about the images that are in ophthalmology? What about the images that are in wound care? What about all the other images that are just scattered around and siloed everywhere else that all of our providers really want to examine? They want to also, you know, uh, we have um, uh, biologics organizations and medical device organizations and pharmaceutical organizations now that are, and you know, with all the, the um, proteomics, genomics that, that are really looking to access images now. Um, and it's not just our advanced radiology. It's all of the other images, uh, many of the JPEGs that be converted to DICOM. It goes on and on and on and on. And so I think what's more interesting um, for me, at least, is when we think about cloud is, are we thinking about our entire comprehensive portfolio and catalog of images, getting them cataloged, getting them accessible by all of our providers to do uh, and researchers to do the work they need to do and think about it as the next step beyond just DNA. Now, obviously there's a whole bunch of data right, huge studies that are on PAC systems and there's a data problem as we go into cloud um, versus maybe keeping that storage on site. But if we think about that next abstract layer of should we get the, at least, if it's not just the, you know, the if we get at least the archive studies in a big catalog in cloud, that's like the first huge value uh, uh, add that I think we can see um, as we, as we catalog everything else in addition to DNA. Tony, any thoughts around imaging? Sure, I think it's a, it's a, simp it's a, a simple problem of performance and uh, latency that can be solved. I was mentioning earlier that some of these older systems are designed somewhat very chatty. Um, and then if that chattiness is over a larger or longer distance, you can have a, a you know, latency of let's say 50 milliseconds if the app um, ask for the, one of those gigantic uh, images in, in bits and pieces and it does that multiple times, that's where, you know, you wait for a minute to see it, an, an image. But there are ways to, to re-engineer that, re-architect that I suggested. Obviously, the cloud, the uh, PAX vendors that I know of, they're all trying to figure out how to do it uh, in the cloud, um, you know, putting some pieces in the cloud <clears throat> and then some sort of uh, let's call them caches locally for now, and then re-architect their systems to uh, to not do that that chattiness, uh, or uh, uh, do uh, uh, local uh, local zones. I think they're called, mm -hmm. which the cloud vendors offer, um, and there the um, um, I've seen performance better than in our own data center. Uh, with one of those so then it's it's, it's a uh, somewhat of a problem not that but traditionally if you want to take the old one the old packs and put them in the cloud and then wait for those images it could be a very slow and experience would be terrible all right let's go for our lightning round of final thoughts um final piece of advice final thought best nugget out there for someone in a comparable position at another organization john kravitz let's start with you say don't be afraid uh moving forward uh talk to your colleagues talk to people that have been there and done that uh get some experience from them um wrong ideas buy them you know collegial um relationships go a long way i think we can allay some of the fear and apprehension that we have uh in this state and and i think there are resources available take advantage of those resources uh, you'll never go wrong by engaging a consulting group that's done this in pharmaceutical or other industries that can help you. So you are successful. So I'll leave it at that. Very good, Tony. Well, you know, these kind of uh, uh, efforts, you know, me migrating uh, to the cloud and, and, and so on, uh, they're probably the biggest projects that technologies uh, group undertake. And they're, they're big and they're complex with lots of moving parts, um, including the fact that you have to for a while uh, run uh, two paradigms on prem and on cloud or maybe multiple clouds, as, as John Kay said. Um, and therefore, preparation, planning, teaming, team um, um, readiness and, and product management or sorry, program management are super critical uh, for the success and you know, building those or, or preparing for those uh, before the plan is, is the uh, effort is started is absolutely critical. Otherwise, there will be colossal uh, challenges and impacts. Now, there's always going to be things that you don't anticipate, um, um, you know, even in the best of uh, analysis that you start with. 
uh, which you have to do, you know, take an, uh, an inventory of your entire uh, uh, collection of applications, but uh, still, um, you know, be, being prepared and being ready, uh, you can um, manage any, any surprises. The other thing is, um, uh, I find important that um, to, even in the, from the old days of on-prem, um, having reference architectures for classes of applications, which is basically defining how those applications are deployed and managed and so on and so forth for the cloud at this time is super important. So the migration is, is a little bit more of a factory, if you want, um, versus uh, one-offs. Very good, John Squayo, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I think yeah, we have many choices as provider as provider systems, right? We can um, go with the hosted solutions by our EMRs or our other key vendors. We can go to Colo um, as another alternative to on-prem. On we can go to our public cloud providers. I think the all these choices, right? There's there's probably the right choice at for the right time for the for for a particular application to reside. And um, it's tough to make all those decisions when a lot of your staff does not necessarily, you know, um, have mastered all of those and, and have those skills and have that experience. So the other piece of it is, I think a lot of provider systems are, are um, you know, uh, start with one public cloud provider and they hear their story. They try to also venture and hear the other stories. And it's very hard to put this entire puzzle together of what should my optimal hybrid cloud look like with our portfolio, our roadmap and our elasticity that may be needed for what John mentioned about possibly acquisition that we may not know about or merger and these upcoming types of consolidations. So the point is, I think it's really important to get a partner that has done it before in some industry, ideally something within the um, similar regulations like HIPAA, uh, you know, uh, PHI and, uh, and understands the 21st Century Cures Act and the implications um, to really help you make that agnostic choice. You'll probably land somewhere in the hybrid range for, uh, you know, emphasizing one cloud over the other for different types of capabilities. And um, I think it's very important to, to get a, a, an agnostic, uh, um, or, uh, you know, opinion, POV, and help to be able to make those choices that's optimal for your organization. Excellent. Well, that's about all we had time for today regarding continuing education. You can use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording of this event is ready for viewing. Do you want to sponsor sponsor an event with us? You can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team. You can go to our website to register for upcoming webinars. With that, I want to thank our tremendous panel today, John Kravitz, Tony Ambrosi, and John Squayo. And I want to thank Sidious Tech for sponsoring, making the event possible, and our attendees for coming. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.